Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this first of the year presentation of Grant Social Medicine Grand Rounds, which is sponsored by the Health Equity and Transactional Social Science Series and the Rangel Prof Professorial Endowment. We have Grand Rounds monthly, semi-monthly throughout the year. If you're not on our waiting list, um, on our mailing list, please get on. Please, please join us. Um, today, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Robin Spencer, who is an Associate Professor of History at Lehman College CUNY. Professor Spencer is um, a uh, got her PhD in history at, from Columbia. Her research focuses on black social protest after World War II on working and social <clears throat> working class radicalism, urban class urban radicalism and gender. She explores overlapping and intersecting boundaries between social protest movements. She's co-founder of the Intersectional Black Panther Party History Project and has written widely on gender and black power. Her book the Revolution Has Come, Black Power, Gender, and the Black Panther Party in Oakland was published in 2016. Dr. Spencer has received awards for her work from the Mellon Foundation, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the Association of Black Women Historians. Her current research is focused on Black protest activism against the war in Vietnam, and on two radical Black women, Angela Davis and Pat Murphy Robinson, so there's much to look forward to in the future. But her topic for us today draws on her book and I'll let her go ahead and introduce it to you. Welcome, Dr. Spencer. Thank you, thank you uh, so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you virtually and to have the opportunity to talk about my work, to talk about the Black Panther Party, one of the most um, influential Black power organizations and really grassroots political organizations in US history, in modern US history. So I'm thrilled to be able to speak to people who are interested in the Panthers, especially through the lens of health, because oftentimes the Panthers are not um, connected to theories of wellness, health, uh, the politics of health, um, or anything like that. So it's the goal of this talk to be able to share some insights that I've had as I have worked on the Panthers and analyzed their, their movements, their history and legacy, especially through the primary sources, right? So the goal for the talk is to be able to give you a sense of how health operated in the Panthers history and also to give you a sense of how the Panthers theorized health and wellness, what health meant to them and how it shaped what they did out in the world, as well as how it shaped how they moved internally as an organization, as an organizational um, entity. So that's the program for this um, this time together. There will be time at the end for questions and commentary. So please don't hesitate to um, save your questions till then. You can also put them in the chat. I probably won't be able to engage because I'll be sort of multitasking and everything, but uh, at least I will have them and I can, you know, glance through them as we go, as we go through. I'm going to open a slide deck for us to view, but before I do that, I want to talk about just how I became um, aware of the Panthers history and health, and I don't need a slideshow for that. So I wanted to say that when I was in graduate school uh, doing research on the Black Panthers, and I was based in New York, and I was able to come out here, there to California to go to the Stanford Library, go to Oakland, go to Richmond, go to many of those places where the Panthers had put their stamp and had a real deep impact, um, even though the organization um, was decades um, earlier than the time when I arrived in the 1990s. 
I was soon amazed at the big footprint that the Panthers had left. And when I started to meet people who were involved in the organization and ask them about their experiences, the question of community control, community programs, community service were so central to how they experienced their time in the Black Panthers. And soon enough, I had um, met a Black Panther named Melvin Dixon, who is um, with the ancestors now, but he was continuing the Panther legacy by doing political work on the streets of Oakland. So I joined him. It was a great way to kind of see the public reaction to the Black Panthers. It was just me, him, a table and a banner and our voices uh, trying to raise awareness about various issues. And one of the things that he was focused on as part of the commemoration committee for the Black Panther Party was on the question of health. And in particular, he was educating people about the Panthers history in terms of providing free medical care as a political act, as an act of political education. And one of the days that we were together, we actually went and knocked on doors in order to inform people that 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 he had he had arranged for free dental care, um, one day a week at this clinic. So letting people know that they could come on down, you know, during these hours and and check it out and get free free services. So the experience of knocking on doors. Um, people opening doors, <laughs> talking to them, to try to explain to them that there wasn't a gimmick or um, an ask or any kind of um, entanglement that was going to result in them coming down and having these free medical services and hearing their stories of the alienation from good health and the ways in which they had not been able to access quality care and all of the ailments. I mean, we started with the dentist is there, but inevitably we got a laundry list of ailments um, that people were living with. And the, the weight of that, the weight of that stayed with me. The weight of one, the power of working with him and feeling like we could offer something to people to address at least some part of of an issue that they might have been facing in terms of their health, their dental health. But also it underscored to me just how central it was that the Panthers saw health as inextricable from race and racism, saw health as something to struggle around, to, um, to understand health in a holistic way. People were not only talking about their bodily ailments, they were talking about their larger context. Um, and how their larger context was eroding their good, their good health. So that was sort of my, my, that was one of the first things that I did when I came out to the Bay Area that wasn't me in the archives looking at boxes, was me with Melvin Dixon doing political work, knocking on doors, speaking to ordinary people, and just gaining an understanding of just how central the Panthers were to the memory um, of Oaklanders, that people were proud, people knew who we were, or knew the banner, and knew, you know, the a sense of that the Panthers was part of the local history, part of the lore, and had also put a stamp on the city that um, connected it to political tendencies and political organizing all around the country and all around the world. Just from our little card table on the corner in West Oakland, I was able to see that. And it really impressed upon me just how central health was to the Panthers organizational mission, to their vision, to their understanding of so much of what they were trying to do and how they try to centralize health in ways that scholars really have not um, unearthed, unearthed. Now, I wanna point you to Alondra Nelson's wonderful book, Body and Soul, which talks about the Black Panther Party and sickle cell anemia. I'll talk about that a little later. It's a great, great um, analysis and look at a, you know, an understudied sort of element of what the Panthers did. And there, more research has come, more is in the pipeline. But the research in the pipeline and research in our books 
sometimes does not filter out. So I was pleased as a historian who deals a lot with the knowledge in books that the people, the people on the streets had that knowledge. So they had the knowledge of the Panthers and what they had done in Oakland to contribute to the politicization of health and what all of that meant. So I just wanted to start with that so you can get a larger sense of how I come to this topic um, to get a sense that the Panthers history with health was just not something frozen in the 60s and 70s that Panthers and their Panthers around today, veterans who are still out there in the communities doing work around raising awareness, literally knocking on doors, trying to provide services. So I just wanted to start with that. I'm going to um, just take a moment and set up the slide deck so that um, to help frame the rest of what I'm gonna say. So there'll be a moment where um, the screen may turn dark or maybe not. Hopefully you're looking at a screen with a bright yellow border, survival pending revolution. Another look for the Panthers um, health programs. I want to start with another um, sort of frame to understand health. And I wanna use the definition of racism offered out by geographer and activist, co-founder of Critical Resistance, um, Ruth Wilson Gilmore, where she talks about racism and she directly connects it to issues of health. So she says that um, racism is the state sanction and legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerability to premature death in distinct yet densely interconnected political geographies. This definition of racism, which came out of her book, Golden Gulag in 2007, I think she was developing it earlier, but it became, I guess uh, it was disseminated through, through that uh, bit of writing, really has shaped how people understand what racism is, right? Not an individual possession, yes, structural, but directly connected to premature death, right? And thereby connected to questions of life, of bodily integrity, and of how Black bodies move through racist spaces, racist geographies in order to, and I guess how they're able to, um, how they're impeded from a full expression of, of their lives, right? So I wanted to start with that because it's very key to helping us understand uh, what the Panthers were, were um, worth to do. Now the Panthers were in a lot of ways uh, connected to these broader ideas of health, and its connection to racism and the wellness of not only black bodies, but other bodies too. And thinking about how shining the spotlight on health for African-Americans also sheds light on so many other groups who are also struggling on the other side of the health, health divide. Now, if you, you may remember that um, in 2020, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd and others at the hands of the state. And during the first wave, we could say, of the global coronavirus pandemic, many entities and organizations came out with statements about race and racism. So I wanted to read the one um, by the AMA Journal of, um, the, sorry, the Association of Medical Colleges, which came out in June, 2020, where they said, um, as healers and educators of the next generation of physicians and scientists, the people of America's medical schools and teaching hospitals bear responsibility to ameliorate factors that negatively affect 
the health of our patients and communities. And then they had a list, poverty, education, access to transportation, healthy food, and health care. Um, what is health? How does race constitute health outcomes? How does that connect to the statement about racism being part and parcel of ending people's lives, right? In ways that are spectacular, like we see uh, that we saw in the summer of 2020, and in ways that are routine that we see on a daily basis as people struggle against the poverty, education, access to transportation, healthy food, and health care. Right. The American Medical Association um, Journal of Ethics is, is where the organization White Coats for Black Lives, which started in 2014 as a medical trainee run organization that was born out of the National White Coat Die-In demonstration that took place in 2014. And their statement in 2014 talked about racism as one of the major causes of health problems in the US and talking about the black white mortality gap, right? Between 1970 and 2004, the black white morality gap resulted in more than 2.7 million excess black deaths, making racism a more potent killer than prostate, breast or colon cancer, right? Physicians as intimately involved with institutions that contribute to the victimization of black people and the people of color, um, and then they talked about the quality of care, inadequate um, screenings, um, access to transplants, and talked not just about physician bias, but structural issues that are part and parcel of the healthcare system writ large, right? that also contribute to this larger question of this entanglement between um, racism and larger questions of health. So when we think about the Black Panther Party and what they were trying to do when it came to health, it's really, really important to, um, to kind of put that into context, both the context that they grew out of, which I'm gonna talk about now in the 60s and 70s, and then the context that we are in now in this moment where these debates are still alive Although oftentimes it's not radical black social movements that are seen as shaping the ideologies that can help us find a way out of the current impasse, right? So thinking about, well, what did the Panthers contribute to these larger questions of, of health? What did they do actually? I'm gonna start with, um, just a quick bio of the Panthers and then dive into some of the ways that they try to address health. And right now you're looking at a picture of um, the People's Free Health Center in Boston around 1970. And it's just one of the places that the Panthers created where people could come and get free um, health care. So the Panthers, uh, the Black Panther Party started in 1966, founded in Oakland, California by Huey Newton and Bobby Seale. There were many Black Panther parties um, around the country at the time, but the Panthers in Oakland became the predominant one that um, kind of defined the name in, in key ways. And they started with a uh, 10 point platform and program, which gave a foundational sense of what the organization was advocating for, right? Huey Newton and Bobby Seale were community college students at Merritt College at the time in Oakland. They'd come together after uh, quite a few years as workers and as members and as floaters through various grassroots political organizations. And having grown up in Oakland and as the children of migrants to the Bay Area, after the World War II period, when so many African-Americans relocated from the South to the Bay Area with the promise of work in war industries that was quickly evaporated after the war was over, 
they grew up in a context where they understood the overlap and connections between the various means of oppression that they saw around them. So the 10 point platform and program talked about full employment, housing, quality of education, ending police brutality, jury of your peers, and freedom from racial inequalities, poverty, structural barriers, et cetera. They were deeply influenced by thinkers such as Malcolm X, Queen Mother Moore, Frantz Fanon, and others. Although the Panthers are known for their strong stance favoring self-defense, uh, which involved um, armed self-defense using weapons as they started out during the time where the open carry law in California allowed them to, to do that. It's important to note that as they were developing um, their ideology that they started to understand self-defense in broader terms. Their self-defense was not just an armed action with a weapon, but that self-defense was a way of attacking the inequalities, the injustices that influenced and um, shaped people's political lives, their social outcomes, their education, and yes, their ability to be and feel well. That had to do with the water they drank, the schools they went to, and the kind of food that you did or did not get, what your grocery stores carried, how many liquor stores were in your neighborhood, um, how hungry you were and how often you were hungry, uh, all of those things and their manifestations of unwellness with, with uh, various uh, disease and, um, and malaise. They understood health in that big picture way, right? They understood health and good health being part of a structure that would be connected to larger ideas of self-defense, um, defending yourself against the killer that could be poor nutrition, right? It's not gonna come and bang down your door in the middle of the night and leave you with bullet holes, but slowly it's going to wear you down. Lead, the impact of living with rodents and the way that rodents were such a, uh, a scourge in, in uh, poor people's neighborhoods at the time, right? They saw all of that as connected to health, Right. So when you think about what the Panthers did, um, you see that as kind of a foundational element of their politics that oftentimes goes unexplored. So, for example, when they created like organizational structures, I mentioned it was uh, founded in Oakland. It would spread nationwide and even internationally as activists around the country wanted to become part of the Black Panther Party. So when they created procedures for, organize, uh, for chapters to join, for branches to be connected to chapters, et cetera, they talked about particular issues. And alongside issues like the police, jails and courts, um, political and economics, uh, unemployment, housing, international relations, the draft, they also had welfare and health together as a category through which uh, the different chapters and branches would seek to one, organize people to fight against and to fight for revolutionary change in how health and wellness was understood in how um, welfare was understood at the time. So the Panthers created community programs and this image is an example of one of those community programs. The community programs um, included many different uh, types of initiatives. So everything from taking people to prison, to visit their relatives, to escorting seniors to banks, to giving away free food, healthy, nutritious food, with, as they like to say, sometimes a chicken in every bag to the extent that they could, organizing people around these um, ways of addressing health became something that they did under, under the banner of their community program. And the Breakfast for School Children program is one of their most well-known programs. 
in the fact that they fed thousands of school children every week by providing food before, before school. And that had to do with their understandings of what it took to, to learn, to address educational outcomes by thinking about the body in school and what it needs to be safe, to be whole, to be healthy, as not just something that happens in the structure of the, in the structure of the school and what the teacher can provide, but as something that should be um, modeled from what we can imagine a demand from the state to be, which is nutritious meals before, before school. And when the Panthers began these programs from the breakfast of school children, uh, for school children, as I mentioned, to the creation of the health centers and clinics that you see there, they, it allowed them to root themselves in communities. It was for some a uh, safer door to enter the organization in that it was an attempt to address a bread and butter issue. And that's essential to know because many people would argue an organization like the Black Panther Party, they were dreamers. They were um, self-styled self -style revolutionaries trying to transform the world. And it was, it seemed lofty, but it's important to know that they brought down those lofty goals to the level of the meal that you ate and its impact on your ability to experience um, health. And this is one way we can kind of reframe how we think about uh, what the Panthers did, what their impact was thinking about, um, thinking about health. So the Panthers created many of these um, programs. So I wanna switch slides. And the programs were connected in broad ways. It wasn't just, okay, a turn to these community programs. The Panther chapters around the country adopted the community programs, the clinics, the breakfast program that met the needs organically of the locations that they were in. But those programs coexisted with the many other initiatives that they took part in which they also understood as elements of self-defense and also directly connected to health. Voting, voting registration, uh, for example. You see people feeding, um, getting together in the mornings to provide nutritious meals before school. You see people coming together to put out a newspaper, Right, and that newspaper would educate people to challenge and broaden the type of education that people would get um, in the school in the school setting. Uh, they would give speeches to international audiences. That's Connie Matthews speaking. Um, I believe I'm, I'm not quite sure. I want to say, but somewhere um, in in one of the Scandinavian countries to supporters of the Black Panthers sharing their mission. It's important to note that everyone in this image or most people in these images are women. And I chose those images in particular to help us to understand that when we think about what the Panthers did, what their impact on larger issues of health, we also have to think about the role that women played in carrying out that larger, that larger mission. In the Bay Area, uh, the Panthers created health clinics in the 1970s. And these health clinics were seen as, along with the other programs, were seen as dangerous. That's important to note too. These health clinics and the Panthers community programs faced surveillance. The people who gave space to the Panthers to carry out this element of their political vision were harassed, they were surveilled, they were infiltrated, uh, negative press and publicity um, surrounded these institutions. But people on the ground understood that they could get something there. And in the getting of the something, the getting of the healthcare, the getting of the service, 
the Panthers used that as an opportunity to politicize, to provide an example that the, this little political organization can provide free health care. Why is it that the state cannot or does not? We have doctors volunteering their time, right? Why is it that if you were to go see a doctor in other contexts context and circumstances, it would be unaffordable to you? Why is that? And the Panthers were part of a larger movement, right? That was happening all around the country, questioning the commodification of health, the commodification of everything in the Bay Area, the root, the, you know, the home of the counterculture, the questioning of um, commodifications and relationships um, that were developed out of those was so central to what was going on with groups like the diggers who were focused on what they call free everything. What does it mean to create opportunities for people to receive goods and services from a barter perspective outside of a com commodified perspective? What does this do to our larger understandings of capitalism, right? It's one thing to say, I'm undoing capitalism. And then people will say, well, again, that big lofty idea, like how are we undoing capitalism? And again, the Panthers would bring it down to come on down, you know, Tuesdays and Thursdays for free healthcare. And it might, and it did actually politicize people. And that was the goal. The goal was never let's get huge networks of doctors all around the country and we're gonna create Panther hospitals that are gonna you know, serve the people for free everywhere. And you know, that's, we're gonna create an alternative infrastructure. The goal was not to scale up. Right? The goal was to transform people's consciousness and to have them think critically about how they engage with the larger questions of health. So here's an example of this opening of the Bobby Seal People's Free Health Clinics. And where it says a person's health is their most valuable possession. Improper health care and ad inadequate facilities can be used to perpetuate genocide on the people. Right. And the fascinating thing that I always think when I'm giving talks like this, I'm always like re sort of recalling today and I'm now recalling um, during you know 2020 how so many things became free, right? That before were behind paywalls and were inaccessible. And there was a moment where you thought, well, why isn't this always like this, right? And the Panthers seized and tried to create as many of those moments as they could to have people understand about larger questions of health. These images are uh, focused on how they uh, were so focused on proper nutrition. I wanna say that these breakfast programs were not just a site of extraction, like come and gather the food and you're fortified and you go out. They were sites of community building. They were political education sites. They were sites where um, Panther members could come down and volunteer to become you know, part of it. Uh, local merchants would donate the food. So it became a true, like the, the setting up of the clinic itself became a model for the type of society that they were trying to create. All right, it wasn't just about, um, it was, I, I guess we could say it was a collective effort and a collective effort that was also deeply, um, deeply, deeply political. So I have some examples from outside of California to give a sense of the spread, Baltimore, and then in Chicago as well. Right. This image from an event the Panthers put on in 1972 in the Bay Area, um, giving away groceries with the chicken in every bag. And again, I'm thinking about today when terms like food deserts and mutual aid are resonant. To think about the Panthers, like in 1970, you know, in the early 1970s, 
basically enacting some of those same ideas. This idea that um, things could be given away, that commodification of you know, resources was not always the way, a challenge to how people understood capitalism, a connection to this larger question of welfare. This is when they really began to deeply engage the welfare rights movement and this larger question of what is welfare? Um, what is your welfare? Um, is wealth, you know, welfare as a thing, as a, as a, as a government program, but then welfare as um, something that people deserve to have um, in a, in a, you know, in a very deep, a very deep way. They also started in this period to really engage with uh, elements of spirituality. Uh, you'll see the reverend speaking there. They opened up uh, their own sort of spiritual hub called the Son of Man Temple, which brought in and allowed them to speak to church going uh, residents of Oakland and things like that. And as a, as a way of thinking about the spiritual part of health, the holistic part of health as well. Um, I think that's key to say. Now, some of this was aspirational. A lot of it was flawed and imperfect, right? But the goal is to think about the Panthers' efforts as stepping stones, historical backdrop that we need in order to understand how to move today, what was tried in the past, how does it connect to the possibilities um, that we might see around us? This was their vision of revolution. That's so important. When people think about the Panthers, it's always, again, back to the armed stance and with the weapon. But I like to flip that into the armed stance against all of these social and social ills and political strangleholds that were part of Black life in their era. So the connection between a, an event that has politics, religious figures, free food giveaways, um, et cetera. And what, uh, what, did that, uh, what did that mean? I wanted to show this image of a survival nurse, which is an image that Black Panther Party artist Emery Douglas wrote um, Drew, in order to talk about this concept of survival pending revolution, survival pending revolution, this ideal that we have to survive, right? Bread and butter, you need nutrient, you need, when you wake up, you need shelter, you need, you know, these are the things that they're trying to provide, but you're just not in that mode. You're just not surviving for surviving sake. While you are surviving, you are also shifting your ideology and contributing to an organization that is focused on revolution, right? So this survival nurse, so I wanted to talk uh, just briefly about uh, what it kind of represents. Um, a black woman standing near a bus from the People's Free Busing Program, holding clothing from the People's Free Clothing Program, mm -hmm. holding shoes from the People's Free Shoes Program, a book from the Liberation Schools, a bag of groceries from the People's Free um, Food Program, the cap on her head says People's Free Health Clinics, and a gun at her side, as you see there, right, holstered, and she wears a button that proclaims, I am a revolutionary. So again, to think about how this visually kind of represents how the Panthers saw revolution. They made major strides in raising awareness about things like sickle cell um, anemia, um, focusing publicity on the disease and re really raising their awareness, doing testing. Alondra Nelson's book, Body and Soul, there's a absolutely fabulous job discussing and describing that and helping us to think about that um, in a real way. And I wanted to kind of bring to a close with a look at just where we are today. This is from a demonstration in 20, 
20, which talks about health, race and health. And I think as we move into an era where those connections are increasingly being plumbed, it's important to understand that there's a long history to this and that the 1960s radical actors came together in order to reconceptualize help and not just in a way that was um, theoretical, although they did talk theoretically. So you could look up the Panthers um, and see what was written theoretically around the larger question of health and what does it mean, et cetera, et cetera. But materially, practically, as an organizational stance on the ground in these health clinics, in these breakfast programs, um, in their newspaper, they raised awareness and reflected the growing awareness about all of the ways that health was tied to questions of race and racism. And the idea of premature death was very key to their understanding, even though they didn't articulate it in the terms like um, Dr. Gilmore did, but it, gives, it gave them, and I think it gives us a framework to think about how to reframe how people think about health, because there's a lot of individualizing, right? They always talked about collective, the collective. How can we think about health in a collective way? Not that you made a bad choice or this is your family history, but that you exist in a context in which those things are going to shuttle you towards um, very poor outcomes and premature, premature death. So the Panthers to me are inspirational. They are rooted in history, but as I said, Panthers like Melvin Dixon, um, who's not here anymore, but many are here in their communities, still working with a new generation to raise these questions. So I wanted to stop there just to ensure we have enough time to engage with questions. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I'm just going to stop to share so that I can bring up your all of you in this Zoom space, and I'm going to peek into the chat to see. Mm -hmm. So questions, questions. So maybe I'll, I can look at the ones in the chat and, and start with those and then go, go from there. Okay. Um, so someone from Boston, I should have asked where people were, were from, um, saying that their mother was a Panther, the health center, the literacy programs, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a great, that's a great comment. And yeah. then the rodent issues, um, people don't think about it. If you look at so many images that came out of the Black Panther, they were always like a rat in someone's apartment or in the streets and things like that. And that was one of the biggest issues that they were fighting against. They actually had health centers that were done by the city of Boston in, in the housing developments, but they were still very inadequate. They weren't addressing the needs of the people. And so with the Panther members, we're really trying to find out how to address these needs for cultural awareness and cultural appropriateness because Boston was very racist. The racism that was in Boston and still is in Boston, um, but is not to the level that it was, that to be able to address these things to go into clinics. And they, were, um, they, they did this by doing these health centers that were very user friendly and that was cost of, they were free for the, the community at that time. Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing your, your experience. Um, the funding, I want to answer um, Susan's question about funding. Great question. As I mentioned, they got uh, donations. Um, the Panthers were an organization with a lot of, you know, political savvy around fundraising. So everything from donations from sympathetic um, people with money from the Marlon Brandos to, to others, to royalties from books. 
Panther members published a lot of books and people read those books. I mean, this is a reading movement. People read the books, they bought the books. And so royalties from books were a key, another way that they were able to generate organizational income. And you know, all of that was shuttled to maintaining those clinics. And of course, as I mentioned, the collective, some people who are in the organization, especially in the Bay Area, live together collectively, sharing everything, um, thereby reducing expenses. Um, I should have said this also that when you were in the organization, you were taken care of by the organization. So if you are a Panther member, you went to that health clinic, right? It wasn't just for the community out there. There wasn't that separation, like you were the community and if you needed that health clinic, you could. And so in the archive, I found lots of records of um, everything from discussions of pregnancy within the organization and pre prenatal care and how they're gonna manage that as a health issue, as a politicized health issue to um, discussions of um, you know people's uh, personal medical histories. Okay, so a bit more about the Panthers um, making this transition um, from service position to structural change, how they think about that. Um, yes, this is very true. There is um, so much of the professionalization of activism through this kind of NGO-ish um, model and then funding. And so you're working for transformative change um, but then there's, you know, you also are sort of always perpetuating yourself in a model that, you know, I think models how sometimes people are working against hunger, working against this or that in different parts um, of the world. So survival pending revolution, right? They, first of all, kept the pending revolution um, to be key. They continue to see these programs in a political sense. They resisted the urge to scale up, which oftentimes occurs with successful models like, oh, wow, the health clinic is doing great. We need more of these. We need them everywhere, et cetera. They certainly did spread around the country, but they did not proliferate as like a, you know, a model for different people to put their time into. They continued political education. So they continued to read, discuss, and try to understand what, um, what was the larger goal, right? They struggled with this. Um, one of the things that happened in their history at this time is that they started to focus on election campaigns, which inevitably kind of sucked up um, a lot of organizational energy, which meant less staffing for some of the community programs and a, a growing divide between um, people feeling like they could rely on those programs and their ability to do that. Of course, they were also continually, in, even in the 70s, facing a heavy level of political repression. So battling with imprisonments and raids and arrests and lawsuits, all of those things, you know, uh, what would I say, provided, bumpers on, I guess, how far they could go, how fast they could go. It kind of pushed them, it pushed them back. So it's not necessarily a success story in that sense that I can say, you know, some of the things were wildly successful, like the breakfast program, but of course, then some things were, um, were important because they were tried and they allow us to look back and think about options as we look forward. If, if I could add, if I could just say one thing, and I think it was really flip flopped in, in a way that when we put, this is what happens a lot with, it still happens with community of colors when we're trying to activate and to mobilize within a community. And, I, and I'll give an example, and this is nothing towards my Latino brothers and sisters. When we talk about the promotorist programs, African-Americans have been doing community health workers and been working in barbershops and whatever, whatever, but no one got behind them to support that initiative in order to create a curriculum that could then address, you know, the home visiting, you know, model to make sure we're supporting it. And now with the same thing with, but with the Promotorist program, it was, it was, 
because the numbers are larger and the access to the more population size, there was more mobilization around getting behind that model. Nothing, nothing to take one from another. But when it comes to African-Americans, we've been looking at infant mortality for over 30 years. And yet we still got black women dying at a higher rate than any others. And so is it, is it the black women's fault or is it the community at large fault? Or is it the health system's inability to look at the, the issues that are being faced by not acknowledging black women's uh, verbiage when they come into these health systems and not agreeing with them? So when the Black Panther parties were doing the health systems and trying to really mobilize around this area, we got pushback from the government and they caused dissensions and, that, and, and, and breakdowns within their, within their unit based, which caused, um, which was still a part of like what they did in all areas of, of, of the black diaspora in the United States or wherever across the countries. And so I think that's where there's like this burden that we have to continue to fight against when it comes to racism how does it look in your community and who's placing blame where instead of looking at the infrastructure and supporting the, the, the initiatives that are being done for the people. And I think that's where it always happens. It always gets blamed on the, the group rather than looking at the infrastructure. And I just yeah. need to say that, I'm sorry. No, no, thank you for your commentary. I think hopefully what I said resonated with the way that we think about um, the maternal mortality debate, even the way that people look at incarcerated people and the type of health care issue, how the coronavirus pandemic shed a light on so many precarious, deplorable health conditions at the same time also seemed to suggest that when the will was there, all sorts of transformations about around health that we were told weren't possible, were too hard, or you know, um, the infrastructure for health, the you know, receiving vaccines and all of this. We have to say that there's been a lot of health infrastructure built, you know, in the past uh, two and a half years, and one has to both applaud but then question the priorities, right? And think about again larger questions of health. Because it's one thing to say it's a pandemic, we have to, it's a, it's a crisis, we have to shift up, shift gears and look over here. But then there's the daily, right? There's the daily ways that people's um, lifespan is being eroded, right? Just this idea of a black, white um, gap in people's life expectancy. Um, the fact that somebody living in X neighborhood could live so much less than someone, so much shorter than someone living in Y neighborhood. That raises the question of what is health um, and why do we tend to talk about it so much in these individualistic terms? What do, how can we talk about it structurally? And how have people in the past talked about it structurally? So that's what I wanted to impart here um, today. Other thoughts, uh, questions, comments in our last um, three or four minutes? Anything come to mind? Anyone from the Bay Area out there? Can you open Berkeley, California? <laughs> just I had one comment to make, if that's okay, Dr. Spencer. Um, what you just said um, reminds me of a of something that my good friend always says about how structural racism robs us of our imagination. Um, it robs us of our ability to, to dream unique ways to, to improve society. A lot of times we're told, oh, this will never work or never work here in America. America is different. We, that Things that work in other countries just aren't able to be implemented here. And so we, we stop being able to imagine a new way that the world could be. And I think you're right, what the pandemic did show us was a lot of things that people told us was impossible that wouldn't be able to be done in the United States were done and were done fairly quickly. Um, so sometimes it takes something like a pandemic, something that you know changes how we live to such a degree that we're forced to, to re return to our imagination of what we can do to build a better society. Definitely, and you saw that with, again, people's desire the mutual aid, the free everything. I mean, it wasn't right quite the free everything like the diggers hoped and wanted to and organized around, but there was a lot of free and it. You wondered like, 
hmm, there's no paywall here anymore. I can read, I can, I can exercise all of these things that were like so heavily commodified. And my neighbor's helping me. Like we are helping each other despite the fact that we are locked in fear, locked in, you know, um, you know, all of those, those early days when so much was unknown. Um, and people were afraid to kind of reach out for each other. People reached out anyway in really, really um, beautiful ways. Even this phrase, essential worker, right? All of a sudden, the marginalized, demonized people of the world became essential um, and branded and applauded in ways that um, one hopes was not just performative. And so thinking about like what's happening with labor now has how has the pandemic had an impact on um the rights of workers and, and, and things like that so this is a great this was a huge a wonderful wonderful topic and i i kind of thank you more one of the things that we're working on right now is what's happening with long-term COVID. i mean this very topic as well how is the rollout now being impacted by communities, especially communities of color, when all those wonderful resources have been snatched back? Like there's not, they're not there anymore. People are still dealing with trauma. They're still dealing with the aftermath of COVID, not just the physical body embodiment, but the mental trauma of having to bury so many people or have to deal with all that work or being in the healthcare field and being and seeing all that death you know, and, and, and having your loved ones be positioned here beside you. What does it look like and how are we, how are we dealing with that at this, uh, at this, at this platform? So um, that's just something that I think I would, I would love to talk to you some more offline about that because we're having a conference soon about that very issue. Definitely, definitely. Um, we'll definitely stay in touch. I do think that there is, um, the housing crisis, like the connection between housing and health, the way that, you know, there was a moratorium on evictions, for example, and something that we would have never thought could happen. Not that it was complete, not that it was, you know, um, perfectly applied, but the rhetoric of it was there and it did occur in some instances. And what did it mean when that was, like you said, snatched back? Mm -hmm. for sure all right thank you so much dr spencer for being a part of our health equity and translational social science research theme webinar series we're so happy to have you and then um feel free it looks like uh felicia just put her email in there so if you want to talk offline with her she's like oh there you go there's your email too Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Take care, everyone. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye.